and presenting Union Gospel Presses Sunday School Lesson Number One, Start of the Fall Quarter, Sunday, September fifth, twenty twenty one. The lesson is entitled Ordination of Aaron and His Sons. Lesson text comes from Leviticus chapter eight, verses one through thirteen. Related scriptures are Exodus chapter twenty nine, verses one through thirty seven. Hebrews 10, 19 through 25, Acts 22, 14 through 16. The place is Mount Sinai. The time is about 1445 BC. We are beginning a new series of lessons in the book of Leviticus and Numbers that will focus on the importance of living out our faith, especially in difficult times. All of us have encountered moments of distress that have tested our faith, or we know someone who has experienced such trials. In these stressful moments, we find out what we are really made of. As we read the, past, the pages of Scripture, we realize that God has designed us to prevail through all situations, good and bad. Our study this quarter in Leviticus and Numbers will help us build our faith so that when it is tested, we will be found faithful. An enduring, unwavering faith must grasp the holiness of God. Today's aim, facts. To observe three very important aspects of God's holiness. Principle, to emphasize that God's children are to reflect the holiness of the Heavenly Father. Application, to investigate our personal lives with the goal of becoming more consistent in our personal holiness. Illustrating the lesson. The visual aid summarizes a basic principle we can draw from the lesson text. Following our own standards through our own efforts leads to sinful self-righteousness. Following the standards set forth in God's word humbles us and leads to true holiness and Christ-likeness. Practical points. One, we should never be irrelevant when we speak to God. We should fear and obey him, Leviticus 8, 1 through 2. Two, always try to display the Lord's attributes to others, verses 3 through, five, three through 4. Three, we should always be able to point to the Lord's authority over whatever we do. If we cannot, it is not worth doing, Leviticus 8, 5, Romans 14, 23. Four, as Christians, we should clothe ourselves in righteousness as representatives of God's holiness, verses 6 through 10. Five, God's purposes, even material things, for service to him. So, we should be good stewards of his gifts, verse 11. Six, we should always respect our leaders. They are put in place by God, verse 12 through 13. Golden text. Let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Hebrews 10.22 Today we have three lesson outlines. The first is called by the Lord, coming from Leviticus 8.1-4. through 4. The second is prepared by the Lord, Leviticus 8.5-9. through 9. And the third is ordained by the Lord, Leviticus 8. 13 through 13. Introduction. One of the most overlooked characteristics of God in modern biblical theological teaching is his holiness. The word holiness speaks of separation. God is holy in that he is separate, separate from the world he created. He is separate from the evil world system that dominates and controls fallen human thought. Since humans are created in the image of God, God calls us to be holy as well, just as he is holy. Leviticus 11, 44, 1 Peter 1, 15 through 16. The perfect holiness of God suggests that he pays attention to details. Even what seems like little things to us are important to the Lord. This week's lesson shows that God calls us to be holy, but he does not require us to manufacture holiness in ourselves. As we will see, he has anointed us with the Holy Spirit to produce the fruits of the Spirit in our lives. Called by God, Leviticus 8, 1. 
And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, verse 2, Take Aaron and his sons with him, and the garments, and the anointing oil, and a bullock for the sin offering, and two rams, and a basket of unleavened bread. Verse 3, And gather all thou, and gather thou all the congregation together unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. Verse 4. And Moses did as the Lord commanded him, and the assembly was gathered together unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. God calls for Aaron and his sons, Leviticus 8, 1. One of the greatest problems humans face is that we are sinful and God is holy. Sinful humans cannot approach a holy God on their own, but must have someone to represent them. In order to come to God, we must have a representative to appear before him on our behalf. God's answer to this predicament for his Old Testament people was the priesthood. Today, because of the death and resurrection of Jesus, Christ is our great high priest and represents all believers before God. Hebrews 4, 14 through 16. Before Christ came, however, God chose Aaron and his sons to serve as priests under the old covenant established through Moses. Since Aaron and his sons were also guilty of sin, they had to be cleansed or ritually made whole. If they were going to serve as priests between people and God, they were specifically chosen by God for unique service. This did not make them better than anyone else, and it did not absolve them of their own personal sins. It did, however, require specific rituals to consecrate them or set them apart for their service to the Lord. God began by telling Moses to call Aaron and his sons together. He then instructed Moses to take certain garments, anointing oil, a bull for a sin offering, two rams, and a basket of unleavened bread. All these elements were necessary to fulfill the requirements for the ordination of priests as set forth in Exodus 29, a public ceremony, Leviticus 8, 3 through 4. Moses sent Aaron and his sons before the entire assembly at the entrance of the tabernacle. The ceremony was designed to be in a public setting and not a private space. The people were to see who their priests were and that God had designated them for this office. The priesthood was not an office to be aspired to, but one for which the individual was chosen. Future priests had to be descendants of Aaron in order to qualify. Moses did as God had directed, and the people were gathered at the tabernacle for the ordination of their priests. While the ceremony did not mean the priest suddenly became superhuman and would no longer sin, it did show publicly that God had chosen these specific men for this unique role, and as such, they were to be respected by the people. Prepared by the Lord. Verse 5. And Moses said unto the congregation, This is the thing which the Lord commanded to be done. Verse 6. And Moses brought Aaron and his sons and washed them with water. Verse 7. And he put upon him the coat and girded him with the girdle, and clothed him with the robe, and put the ephod upon him, and he girded him with the curious girdle of the ephod, and bound it unto him therewith. Verse 8. And he put the breastplate upon him. Also he put in the breastplate the urim and the therum. Verse 9. And he put the, the mitre upon his head. Also upon the mitre, even upon his forefront, did he put the golden plate, the holy crown, as the Lord commanded Moses. The commandment of the Lord, Leviticus 8, 5. When the people had gathered at the entrance of the tabernacle, Moses declared to them that the following ceremony had been commanded by God. Aaron was not chosen by Moses as a result of nepotism, Rather, he was chosen by God. Moses had nothing to do with Aaron's appointment to serve as the first high priest. The people needed to understand at the outset that God had ordained not only those who would serve as priests, but also the priesthood itself. Again, this was not Moses' idea of the best way for the people to come to God. 
he was only following the directives he received from the Lord, including the institution of the priesthood under the covenant and those who would serve in this capacity. The washing of the priests, Leviticus 8, 6. The first act in this ceremony was the washing or cleansing of Aaron and his sons. In a very humbling action, Aaron and his sons had their bodies washed by Moses before the gathered assembly. The fact that Moses washed them illustrated that they could not cleanse themselves of their own personal sin, but had to be cleansed by someone, some, by another. Moses, since Moses was the mediator of the old covenant, this duty fell on him. The modern significance of this act is that we too cannot cleanse ourselves of our personal sin. We have to be washed by someone else, namely Jesus. We are cleansed not by water, but by the perfect blood of Jesus. 1 Peter 1, 18-19 Our sins have been washed away by the mediator of the new covenant, who now covenant we now live under, which was ushered in by Christ himself. Having been cleansed of sin, we are to publicly profess Jesus as our Lord and risen Savior. Under the new covenant, all Christians are priests before God. 1 Peter 2, 9 through 10. Revelations 5, 9 through 10. Even as Christ is our great high priest in heaven, we have been chosen and cleansed by God to serve him in loving obedience, representing him to the world in which we live. Just as the washing of Aaron and his sons was a one-time event, our sins are washed away by the blood of Christ once and for all. Jesus washed the disciples' feet and stated that because they had already been washed completely, they needed only to have their feet washed. John 13, 1-10 He was distinguishing between the one-time event of justification whereby God declares us righteous through faith and the ongoing process of sanctification pictured by the washing of the disciples' feet. That process is a continual exercise of being conformed daily to the image of Christ. Jesus washed the disciples' feet because they got dirty from the dusty roads they traveled. Likewise, we get dirty from sin we commit each day. This does not negate our initial cleansing, however. We confess our sins to God so we can experience restoration and renewal, but our initial cleansing is permanent. Priestly Garments and the Ephod Leviticus 8, 7 After Aaron and his sons were washed, the next step was to clothe Aaron with the priestly garments. Exodus 28, 4-36 The purpose of these garments was not just to cover his nakedness, but to invest the worship of the Lord with beauty and to elevate the role and office of the high priest. Verse 2 Additionally, they would clearly identify the high priest to the people. An interesting element to all the priestly garments is that neither Aaron nor his sons had anything to do with making them. They were already made and ready to be worn for the first time on this occasion. In other words, this was not a haphazard event that was quickly thrown together. Great preparation had been made for quite some time so the garments would be ready. It was because of the work of skilled craftsmen that Aaron and his sons were able to don the special garments of priests. The high priest coat, Leviticus 8-7, was a tunic that was worn next to the skin and reached to the feet. It was tied with a girdle or sash around the waist to hold it close to the body. A robe and outer garment was worn over the coat. It was made of a beautiful combination of blue, purple, and scarlet materials with golden bells on the hem. The ephod, which was worn over the robe, was a special article of clothing that was similar in appearance to an apron. It was made of two pieces joined at the shoulders and was open on both sides. The ephod was made of gold, blue, purple, and scarlet threads. These threads were skillfully woven together by craftsmen who were gifted and equipped by God for such a purpose. Two onyx stones were set on the shoulder pieces of the ephod, and each stone was to have the names of the six of the tribes of Israel engraved on it. This showed that the high priest bore Israel on his shoulders, a place of work. 
The duties of the priests were not easy and included great labor on behalf of the people. The curious girdle was made of the same material as the ephod. It was a belt that held the ephod to the body at the waist. The breastplate, Leviticus 8, 8 through 9. The breastplate was then placed upon the high priest Aaron. The square blessed breastplate was made of woven material and rested on the front of the ephod. Like the other priestly garments, it was to be skillfully made and consisted of gold, purple, blue, and scarlet threads. The specification given in Exodus 28, 15-29 concerning the making of the breastplate shows that the materials are important to God. The office of the high priest, as well as that of the priest, was not to be seen as something common, and the garments reflected that fact. Attached to the breastplate were twelve precious stones, each one engraved with the name of a tribe of Israel. God no doubt used precious stones because his people are precious to him. Similar stones will also be prominent in the New Jerusalem, the future eternal home of every child of God, Revelations 21, 19 through 20. The breastplate was identified with judgment, Exodus 28:15. The high priest wore the breastplate as he entered God's presence and sought deliverance from God's judgment on behalf of the people. The Orom and Thurum were then placed inside the breastplate. The, the, the text in Leviticus does not reveal their size, shape, number, or even function, so they have in, engendered much special, special, specialization and debate. They are often thought to have been dice-like stones, but they were somehow used on occasion to determine the will of God in certain situations. There is no mention of them in the New Testament, so their association is exclusively with the Old Covenant. We now have the Holy Spirit and Scripture to direct us in, term in determining the will of God. The mitre, Leviticus 8-9, or turban, that was placed on the head of the high priest was similar to a crown. Fastened to the front of it was a plate of pure gold that had the words holiness to the Lord engraved on it. Exodus twenty-eight thirty-six. The high priest in his glorious garments was quite a sight to see for the people of Israel and his responsibilities were great. He was the one who stood between the people and God ordained by God, ordained by the Lord. Verse 10, And Moses took the anointing oil and anointed the tabernacle and all that was therein and sanctified them. Verse 11, And he sprinkled thereof upon the altar seven times and, to, and anointed the altar and all his vessels, both the laver and his foot, to sanctify them. Verse 12, and he poured of the anointed oil upon Aaron's head and anointed him to sanctify him. Verse 13. And, and Moses brought Aaron's sons and put coats upon them and girded them with girdles and put bonnets upon them as the Lord commanded Moses. Anointing all objects. Leviticus 8, 10 through 11. With the ordination of Israel's first priest, might bear some similarities to the modern ordination of individuals to pastoral ministry, there is also much in Leviticus 8 that was unique. Contemporary ordination services focus on the person being ordained. The ordination of Aaron and his sons, however, also included the, cons the consecration of the tabernacle, the altar, and all the utensils and instruments the priests would be using. The anointing would with oil showed the people that these items had been set apart for service to the Lord or sanctified. Nothing was left out and nothing was overlooked. Anointing of the priest, Leviticus 8, 12-13. After anointing the tabernacle and the items in it, Moses then poured oil on Aaron's head to, an to anoint him for service as high priest. Oil is sometimes a symbol of the Holy Spirit in Scripture, and the anointing here likely pictures the Holy Spirit being poured upon Aaron, empowering him for his high priest service. Aaron could not fulfill his duties in his own power. 
he needed a special infusion of God's help. That the oil was poured on Aaron's head and allowed to run down shows that the spirit is given without measure. There was no concern for wasting oil here. Objects such as the altar were sprinkled with oil, but God's chosen servant had oil poured on him. God gives us his spirit without measure to empower, equip, guide, instruct, and convict us. Moses then called for Aaron's sons to come forward, and he clothed them with their priestly garments. The garments worn by the priests were similar than that of the high priest, were simpler than that of the high priest, and were all white. Exodus 28, 40 through 43. Their clothing also made them easily identifiable as priests. Throughout the ordination process, Moses did what he was commanded by God. At no point did God consult with Moses. At no point did Moses challenge God or try to give his input. As a great leader as Moses was, he was still a mere human being. He was not divine or even semi-divine. He was just a man who had been called by God for a specific purpose. God cares about you and the details of your life. He has called you into a particular realm of service and wants to equip you for that role. He has anointed you with holy, with his Holy Spirit to accomplish his will in your life. Have you surrendered to this calling? The only way to do anything of eternal value is to yield to the will of God. Questions. 1. What did God instruct Moses to do with Aaron and his sons? 2. Why was it important for this ceremony to be public? Three, what was the significance of the washing of Aaron and his sons? Four, how are we cleansed under the new covenant? Five, what colors were used in the priestly garments? Six, what was the ephod and what was included in its composition? Eight, what was attached to the breastplate of the high priest and with what was the breastplate associated? Eight, what purpose did the Urim and the Thurum serve? Nine, what does oil sometimes represent in scripture? Ten, how did the consecration of the tabernacle utensils differ from how an Aaron was anointed? This concludes the Sunday School lesson for Sunday, September 5th, 2021. Thank you for listening. God bless.